So before I ask my question, I want to remind members of the web audience to submit their questions. I don't think we've had any from the web earlier in the day, but please feel free. So the first question that I promised, uh, and I'll, I'll make it easy just so we don't run out of impediments and facilitators of integration. I'll ask each of the speakers just to pick one, either a, an impediment to integration or a facilitator of integration and speak uh, about it in the light of all the talks we've just heard. Uh, so I'm not sure I'm going to add anything that intelligent, uh, but I would say I, I wonder if a, f a facilitator we should be thinking about is one that isn't here now, but is probably going to be here in the future, which is um, genetic testing for everybody at birth, right? So at some point, a whole genome is 500 bucks now. That's super cheap. Um, as we move towards cheap, cheaper and cheaper technologies, you can imagine a scenario where everybody's genome is sequenced and it's simply a part of your medical record. I think that becomes a facilitator because then you start to turn uh, healthcare systems into learning systems, right? So you, you're, uh, as, you, as this kind of data is more accessible, so is other types of data, um, passive collection of lifestyle data, for instance. Uh, and so one can certainly imagine that research and healthcare become, become one and the same. And obviously there's, um, there's some drive to, to achieve that, both from the healthcare providers, but also from the payers. Let me ask you a follow-up question. Does that future allow any room for consumer-driven genomics? Is it now consumer-driven interpretation? You know, the genomics will already be there. Yeah, I mean, g genotyping and sequencing is a commodity. Uh, that, I mean, it, we're a genetics lab. We don't do our own sequencing. We outsource it. So uh, I, don't, I, think, I think it doesn't matter too much where it gets done as long as it's done under the, you know, appropriate procedures, but I suspect that those companies will likely pivot to, to interpretation or use of data, not necessarily um, provision of data. Thank you. Siobhan? Um, <clears throat> an area that's come up a tiny bit, but I just wanted to reemphasize in terms of facilitating uh, testing uptake is just insurance coverage. So, um, you know, for as an example, most of the patients I see, New York State Medicaid will now pay for cell-free DNA screening for aneuploidies, so patients will have that test. The patients who run into trouble are people who have private insurance, but it's got a lot of restrictions and limitations, so those women may not have the opportunity for that test if the out-of-pocket is beyond what they can afford. Um, another gap you'll see is um, patients without cancer, but in families with strong family histories of cancer, Medicaid won't pay for, Medicare, excuse me, won't pay for testing prior to diagnosis. So I think that's a huge gap. Where's prevention going to go if that stays around, right? Because that opportunity to identify someone at risk and take steps um, is almost essentially precluded for a lot of my patients if Medicare won't pay because the out-of-pocket's too substantial. And then the other payer issues on genetic counseling. So we've had a lot of discussion about um, not enough genetic counselors, but really the backstory there is the um, billing and paying for genetic counseling. If um, genetic counselors were able to be licensed and be paid independently in every state, I think we'd have a lot more genetic counselors. So I'd say I would advocate strongly for, for as an example, um, issues around the advocacy for gen counseling as being so essential. We heard that all morning. We're hearing that all afternoon. That human face, it's not worth nothing. It's just not paid and reimbursed by insurers today. And I think that's a place where some change could be made very quickly. Danielle? I love hearing about advocating for genetic counselors, so thank you. <laughs> I think one of the barriers that we'll see are those consumers taking their reports to their clinicians who are already overburdened, who already have, you know, a broad spectrum of a specialty that they need to cover. We heard earlier about, you know, urologists identifying men with metastatic prostate cancer as now candidates for BRCA testing, but then following those patients long term, doing cascade testing and looking at their entire population base, let's say, for example, in a primary care clinic, if they're 
have you know a couple thousand patients in their practice, they're going to have various different genetic syndromes that are present in those patients. And the idea that your average primary care physician can keep up to date with all of those various genetic conditions is above and beyond what we can expect from them. They already have um, clinical responsibilities that are significant, and taking on another one, I think, is um, a lot to ask. Thank you, Matthew. I think that um, you know, we haven't made it easy for our physician colleagues to make use of the information that they're that they're getting right now. And um, one thing we I didn't get a chance to to hit on is the creation of um, clinical decision support tools that can be integrated into the EMR. Uh, and that's a loaded question, right? There's a, there's a lot there. So I think this is a real hindrance. Um, we've got data coming from multiple labs. Um, that data is generally of high quality, um, but the same variant could be interpreted multiple different ways depending on who is actually doing the interpretation. How that data then gets into the electronic medical record is a challenge. And then how that interpreted data gets utilized by the physician is another challenge. It's almost as though a whole nother uh, group needs to be created to define requirements for such a system. And then there needs to be an industry standard created like, uh, I don't know if anybody here is old enough to remember the wars between uh, VHS and Betamax, right? Um, these, were, these were tapes that you'd play movies on. Uh, Beta, beta Max uh, didn't win, uh, but yeah, I think that there's there's a need to really get to those industry standards so that we can take full advantage of the data we're generating right now. I'll make one quick observation and then we'll open it to questions. One thing that I heard over and over again in the four presentations was how important the alignment or malalignment of interests was that when a DTC company had the same interest as a research laboratory, things happened. When providers are interested in aneuploidy, patients are interested in gender, there's a, a malalignment. When providers want to provide information and patients are interested in actionability, there's a disconnect. So uh, I think one of the facilitators or barriers, depending upon whether it's alignment or malalignment, is how common the interests are of the various parties involved in the transaction. Let's start with questions over here. Thanks. Hi. Uh, Gail Javits. Question for Danielle. Um, you uh, made the distinction and also cited uh, research that made this distinction between um, DTC testing and medical grade testing, and I was hoping we could drill down a little bit more on what what that distinction means, because in my in my mind it could mean a few different things, and and which one of those could have significant um, implications. So, medical grade, I'm assuming meant CLIA, um, but did the DTC was that also CLIA? And and relatedly, in the literature that you cited. Did they identify the source of discrepancy, where it arose in, ter in terms of when the medical grade lab contradicted the finding of the DTC lab? Was it at the level of the, you know, the AGC or T was wrong, or was it at the level of the interpretation of the raw, raw data was incorrect? So I use the term DTC for kind of any test that I would consider that needed to be repeated in a clinical laboratory. So although many of the DTC tests are done in a CLIA-approved laboratory, um, you know, those tests from 23andMe and now that Ancestry is returning health-related data, um, though, as a clinical genetic counselor, I would repeat all of those tests in a, what I would consider more of a medical-grade laboratory. Um, so that's kind of where I draw the distinction, um, just pretty broadly, although I understand from the regulatory point of view that many of them have some of the similar um, checks and balances. In terms of your second question related to the data, um, it was on both levels. So one, I showed one of the slides where many of, some of the direct-to-consumer testing were <laughs> calling variants that 
um, had increased risks, whereas the laboratory that did that study were calling them benign. So that was on the interpretation side of it. And then there was also variants that were found on DTC that the clinic, uh, I'll call it the medical kind of grade testing company did not find, so in the sequencing data. So it was on both sides of it. Hi, I'm Tina Say from Science News Magazine. Um, I have a question for Andrew and one for Matthew. So Andrew, um, if you are partnering with a direct-to-consumer company uh, for data, but then also using something like Luna data, how do you uh, how do you account for people who maybe are a 23andMe customer who then upload their data to this other service? Uh, are you biasing your your overall data by having duplicates in there? Yeah, so it's a good question. Um, we don't use Luna. I, I I I know only what you've seen on the slide about Luna, um, but we do have. Um, individuals that we've collected through our own studies or through collaborator studies who've also taken a 23andMe test. So it, it's pretty straightforward to weed them out. Um, we create what we call a checksum, um, basically a, a number that gives you some information about genetic identity. And then that number is also generated at 23andMe and where there's a match, you know it's the same person. So it's very straightforward to remove those individuals. And then Matthew, um, if you determine that somebody really should have clinical testing, how do you communicate that to them? And so are they just not allowed to do <laughs> this, uh, this service through Helix, or do you, do you refer them on for, for further testing as well? Uh, thank you for the question. Yeah, so our, our uh, clinical partner, PWN Health, would not uh, allow the test to go through the system and then they would help the individual find a local genetic counselor that they could work with in order to identify next steps. Hi, Nikki Sideropoulos from the University of Vermont and a member of the roundtable. I have a lot of questions and so many comments, but I'm going to focus on one so I don't suck up all the time. <laughs> um, so Matt, question for you. Since you seem to be doing, we, we clearly have seen over and over today, um, DTC isn't going anywhere. It's only increasing. Um, plenty of consumers then left with questions or making sense of data and their results. Um, and then having to interface then potentially with their home health organization and potentially their PCP or whatever provider they then choose. Um, you seem to have a model at Mayo, um, but I wonder if you can expand upon the uh, business planning around how you support what you're doing. Um, because I think if we're going to make this a reality and create a safety net in, in the space where things get real with patients, um, you know, that could be of a lot of value to people to understand maybe how you did the business planning around that because our, our system for getting paid doesn't support the genetic counselors, right? It doesn't support even the molecular pathologist doing a professional interpretation. So I'm kind of curious if you wouldn't mind expanding upon that. Well, yeah, I, there, there's a bit I can talk about. I think getting into the actual financial details um, is challenging in a public forum like this, but uh, at a high level, and then we'll narrow in on, uh, to a more focused, there's no way we could do it ourselves. I, I think that, uh, number one, the Academic Medical Center is a relatively expensive place in order to conduct these types of uh, activities. So if it weren't for our partners, um, we, we, would not be able, we would not be able to do what we're doing with Mayo Clinic Gene Guide. Starting from the very beginning, um, you know, our partner PWN Health is, is reading and has built an automated system to read our pretest questionnaire. You know, if we were to do that ourselves at Mayo, we would have had to program that. Uh, which would have been expensive. We'd have to hire people to monitor it. Um, we'd then have to try and figure out how to practice medicine in all 50 states. So it was kind of a, a non-starter. 
How do we pay for it economically? I can't give you the actual quote, but big picture, this is how it works. We get charged for every order that comes into the system. And we negotiated with our provider partner a, a likely percentage of people who will require additional genetic counseling uh, time either up front or post test. And then based on that, we amortize that cost across all samples that are coming into the system. So it's X dollars for everybody, whether they need counseling or not. And that's predicated upon the idea that we know 10% are gonna need an hour of counseling, right? And so it kind of gets distributed that way. And again, this is all out of pocket. So we're not charging any insurance companies. If we were, if we were actually insurance billing and doing things like that, it'd be a different story, right? You wouldn't be able to spread your costs that way. So that definitely helps. In the lab side, the first test that we created is a, uh, it, even though we're doing DNA sequencing, it's a glorified SNP chip, right? We have more information than we're actually utilizing. We're saying across these uh, 15 conditions, these 17 genes, these are the 115 variants that we want to look at. So up front, we were able to pre-vet every variant that we know would, that we knew would be coming through the pipeline. And with those variants, we then can attach the appropriate interpretive comments. So when it comes to my time to review the quality, um, generate a report, and then sign out that completed report, it's actually quite nimble and quite scalable. Now, there, there's a hundred things that we could talk about in even more detail, but uh, we'll take, we could take that offline and I'd be happy to talk about it. Um, thank you. It was a really interesting set of talks. Um, Michelle Penny, uh, Biogen. Uh, Andy, I've got a question. I think it's a question of clarification. I just couldn't get up quickly enough after your talk. Um, the 23andMe data that goes into Fox Insights, is that the raw data, the summary stats, or just the LARC2 mutation carrier status? I, th I think I'm right in saying there's two phases. The first phase is a list of uh, unequivocally disease-related variants, so risk variants and mutations. But then there's a second phase, which is the majority, if not all, of the variant data. I don't think they've hit the second phase yet. But that would be the raw data. Yeah, although there there is a set of variants on the 23andMe um, array that aren't always released. Um, I guess they might be proprietary. Um, so I don't know if those go in. I don't know, Joyce, if, if you have a comment. So I guess uh, people who know me will be sort of amazed that I got to three o'clock without mentioning the, uh, the evolving drug development paradigm. And part of the reason for asking the question, um, and, and perhaps the other members of the panel would like to comment on this, but you have to imagine that there will be a time in the not too distant future, I hope, when we will need to be connecting participants to trials who are carrying polygenic risk scores or LARC2 mutations or APOE4 mutations to clinical trials that are in pre-symptomatic patients. And I just wonder if, you know, this is something that's basically going to tip the or facilitate or it's going to be a barrier in this area because that's where research and clinical care and drug development sort of collide. So, I mean, I would way. say, particularly for the, the um, example you used, LERC2 and GBA for Parkinson's disease, there are already pretty major efforts to collect patients with those mutations for GBA-specific therapeutics or LERC2-specific <laughs> therapeutics. There is also a move to collect relatives who are carriers with the notion that at some point we're going to want to try these therapeutics in in pre-symptomatic. So I think, I think we're heading in that direction. I'd say there's more resistance or more caution about using PRS. I, I think ultimately we will go there for sure, but there's, I, I think people don't quite know what to do with that from a regulatory perspective, so. 
And I'll chime in there quickly as well. The product that our company has developed, we've termed a living laboratory report. And as the name kind of implies, it's living. It changes over time. We keep in touch with the patients about those updates. But one of the features that it's included in it is the ability to reach back out to those patients to offer them clinical trials for which they may be a candidate for. And so I agree that that will likely be an increasing um, opportunity for patients that they want to participate in because, of course, no one's more invested in that disease than the patient who's at risk for it. Danielle, uh, can't help myself, but uh, lo I love the idea of the living report. Uh, I think it's it's brilliant. I'd like to raise it to the group and, and yourself as well to understand the responsibility of um, both the company, your company, uh, or any other laboratory that wants to move in the direction of a living report versus the responsibility of the physician who originally ordered the test um, and, the, and the patient or the consumer who, the, who now um, has the responsibility for kind of carrying that result. So having sat in the seat of the clinician who ordered many of those genetic tests for our patients, we were always challenged to keep in touch with them over time. The, the clinical genetic counseling model was that we saw a patient often two and sometimes three times for their pre-test and then post-test genetic counseling. And then when something would change in the field, we would literally stand in front of our filing cabinets and say, hmm, you know, X number of these patients now need to have, you know, Y intervention, or at least they're a candidate for it. And how do we reach back out to them? And so what we did, and what I'm sure many of you do, is we put it in a newsletter, but we put all of the updates. So we put BRCA-related updates, we put Lynch syndrome updates, we put you know, the new gene Paul B2 at the time that had come out on the testing market, all in that one newsletter. And it was left up to the patient to determine which of those updates applied to them, read it, actually receive it in the mail, read it, interpret it, and again, decide which one of them applied to them. In our model now, because we're linked to the patient and to their healthcare provider by gene and by variant, they are getting only the information for which is applicable to them. And so they don't have to sort through that 10-page newsletter of which 90% doesn't apply to them. I think we have a web question. Is that correct? Yes. Go ahead. Um, so I have Christy Wees from the Mountain States Regional Genetics Network, and she um, comments that we've mostly discussed adult direct-to-consumer genetic testing today. What about children and pediatrics and access to genetic services? And then her second question is, what role do you see the seven regional genetics networks funded by HRSA taking in the evolution of direct-to-consumer genetics testing? Um, are there any regional genetics education or awareness projects that these groups could help to undertake um, to help clinicians and researchers. Who would like to tackle that? Go ahead. Well, I have an opinion on the first one. I have no clue what to say for the second one. Um, there's kind of an interesting, uh, interesting thought here. So on the one, we talked about it earlier today, right? We talked about prenatal screening, right? And we talked about a newborn screening. And I think there are some parallels and some corollaries that can be drawn between you know, how we're migrating from single gene to multi-gene to large panel uh, DTC type testing. And I think we'll get to the point where you know, really important diseases can be understood from newborn DNA sequencing. Wilson disease is one of them. Um, happened to be a test that I, one of the first tests I created as a fellow many, many years ago. And we tried to create a screening test for it um, based on circulating ceruloplasmin levels in tandem mass spec. Uh, unfortunately, ceruloplasmin levels aren't all that well stabilized in the newborn. So here you have this disease that is so easily treatable with preemptive zinc treatment, um, or you can actually chelate with trientine or other, um, uh, other chelating agents. But that's only after the disease shows up, right? So you have a 16-year-old who looks extremely healthy at 21. They're a completely different person. They're going through neurological symptoms and all this other stuff. So long-winded, I believe you know, that there's going to be a point where we start doing things like 
newborn screening, but instead of taking a little Guthrie card and a blood spot and running biochemistry tests, we're just going to run a different test, and that test is genome sequencing. So that's one approach to thinking about, let's just call it minors, right? Now, though, I think today where we're at with the state, uh, state of the art is I don't think we're well advised to do uh, DTC screening type tests in otherwise healthy minors. Uh, I think the, the two uh, young ladies who talked about their BRCA result really kind of exemplify a lot of the challenges that can come from, you know, that type of testing before, you know, somebody has the ability to actually um, may have a say and fully understand, you know, the, the gravity of, of an outcome. Jeff, I'll leave the last question to you. Thank you. This is most likely for Andrew. I, I think a major breakthrough for the consumer genomics community would be if it led to novel molecules for intractable diseases. So you showed us some really compelling data in Parkinson's uh, GWAS, uh, um, gene, new genes for Parkinson's disease. Can you tell us something about how any of those are progressing towards the therapeutic development? Yeah, I mean, I'd say it's early days, right? I mean, we're 15 years in, but 15 years in the understanding of the biology of a complex trait and then a development of a therapeutic is really, really early days. Um, I think that this is perhaps a bit off topic, but the, cha the, the challenge in interpreting complex genetic data is in that the typical tools we use to understand biology are for mutations, not for complex variant data. But we're starting down that path, the type of um, large scale approaches that we use for genetics, we're now starting to use for, for biology. So I actually think there are two avenues of using this data. First of all, understanding the genetic basis of disease and being able to um, uh, uh, understand biology and come up with therapeutics that are against that biology. And the other part, which goes hand in hand with it, which is <coughs> defining people who would fit with that therapeutic before they know they're sick. So actually, I think the genetic data contributes to both of those spaces. But at this point, it's, it's aspirational. Thanks. I'd like to thank the panelists and the audience for their active participation.